thank you for joining our follow-up webinar from a few months back, COVID-19's impact on Florida vacation rentals and DMOs. I'm Amber O'Connell, Industry Relations Manager here at Visit Florida. Today's webinar is being presented by the Key Data Dashboard team. They're gonna share with us tre trends they're seeing right now in booking activity, occupancy, and rates across the entire state. Also wanna do a plug again for the COVID-19 data dashboard the Visit Florida team has created to track key trends. You can find this dashboard along with several other COVID-19 and industry resources on our partner site at visitflorida.org. And before I introduce our key data dashboard team, I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping items. All of your phone lines are muted and cameras are turned off. You can adjust your view of the presentation at the top right under view options menu. Um, our webinar today will probably be about 45 minutes long and we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. We'll also be answering questions throughout the webinar. So you can submit questions at any time through the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. Um, please don't submit your questions through the chat function, but if you're having any technical difficulties, you can use the chat function to uh, talk to our staff. But submit any questions you have about the presentation through the Q&A pod. And then I just wanna let you know that there's over 500 people registered for today's webinar. So if we are unable to get to your question today, um, you can just email us at partner at visitflorida.org and we will get your question over to the key data team or if it's for our team, we will respond to your question as soon as we can. And again, this webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording will be emailed to you and posted on visitflorida.org within about a week. So with housekeeping out of the way, I'm gonna now turn it over, over to Jason Sprinkle. Jason is currently the CEO of Key Data, the leading provider of vacation rental data for short-term vacation rental industry. He's also the owner of 360 Blue, which manages over 700 luxury homes in Florida and in Colorado. And he's a co-founder of the Sonder Project, which is an international nonprofit whose mission is to strengthen the communities through food, security, clean water, and education. Previously, Jason was the co-founder and CEO of Glad to Have You, which was acquired by HomeAway. He's also a luxury real estate developer and a software attorney. So with that, Jason, why don't you take it away? Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody being here this morning and excited to, uh, to share some data with you. Um, like you guys, you know, we run a, a tourism business here in Florida. It's our home and uh, obviously the, the state's near and dear to our heart. Uh, it's where our families make their living off of tourism as well. And I'm hopeful that the data that we show you today uh, is something that's, uh, you know, meaningful for your businesses. Hopefully it'll give you a little bit of insight um, into the questions that you've got, which is, you know, what can we expect uh, in terms of tourism in the coming months? How is COVID impacting us? Uh, you know, what, what, what does the forecast look like for the next couple of months? Happy to take your questions throughout uh, if you stick them in the question box. And, uh, and just again, wanted to say thank you to Visit Florida for the incredible partnership that we've built over the last couple of years. So I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, I've got uh, Dan Leifeld who will be going through the uh, Florida data for us this morning. Of course, uh, Jacob, as most of you know, is our partner over at Visit Florida and does the, the data analytics uh, for Visit Florida. So a tight partnership team here that have been working hard to put together some good data for you. Excited to show it to you. Um, Real quick, I know that, you know, whenever you're looking at one of these presentations, and we all sit through a lot of them these days, you know, it, it's important to know what you're looking at. Uh, and for us, we think our data is pretty unique from the other data sets and options that you've got out there from a vacation rental standpoint. But before we show you 30 charts, I wanted to show you uh, what the, you know, the source of the data is. And so real quickly, we've got vacation rental managers all over Florida and all over the world at this point. Uh, that we collect data from directly. So some of the names here that you'll recognize from across Florida and many of the markets, some of the bigger names here, we tie into their vacation rental management system, so the reservation system. So essentially, if your family was to go make a reservation with any of these companies across Florida, when you make that reservation, we have a direct feed into that reservation system and that data flows into our charts. So all the charts that you'll see today come direct from reservation data, uh, from the source, not from any kind of scrape data where we're making any kind of estimates or assumptions. Uh, and then secondly, you know, this is the data that uh, these companies in the last slide run their businesses off on a daily basis. Uh, they get to look at the 
analytics that are associated not with just their own data, but the data uh, in the markets that they compete against. And so it's constantly vetted. And we're also very fortunate to call a lot of the DMOs and a lot of the associations in Florida, uh, partners of ours. We work closely with them to make sure that the data is not only accurate, but that it serves their needs uh, and is helpful for Florida for everything from an advocacy perspective uh, to a, uh, you know, a marketing perspective so that we can keep people coming back to Florida and coming back into our communities. Um, and I'm gonna jump in real quick and give you a, a quick glimpse of the national outlook so you have some context. And then uh, Dan is gonna walk you through uh, the Florida stuff, which I think will be a little bit more meaningful to you. But for context purposes, I wanted to show you this. This is Europe versus North America. And we looked at this in our last webinar uh, as uh, summer was just getting started and as really we were at the, the crux of the downfall. And if you look in orange, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize these curves, but this is the COVID cases across Europe and across North America. And I wanted to, to overlay those on the graph uh, against this booking activity because it really tells a much different story when you compare how Europe has handled the, handled the, uh, the COVID crisis versus North America. Obviously, a, a more of a flattening off or a leveling down in, in terms of Europeans cases and uh, a little bit more severe of a lockdown than North America as we open back up. You can see, you know, the, the, the number of bookings in blue there jumped up substantially and then the number of cases obviously followed that. But uh, you do see this kind of overall sense of what happened in North America where we had a, a deep trough in bookings and for all practical purposes in Florida, you know, travel and certainly vacation rentals stopped during the closure there and March 11th to at least the, the, the time leading up to Memorial Day. And then you saw that, that just steep, steep incline and really the story across North America, and you'll see that in Dan's Florida data, was that the, the pinup demand that we were all questioning was definitely there. And as each market across the US opened, the demand proved to be you know, pretty incredible. Within the vacation rental uh, partners in particular, the demand was in many cases, if not most cases, more than what they could take. You know, the typical story across vacation rentals during that time frame was we just didn't have enough people to answer the phone. And the story was that the, you know, the, the vacations for summer that we typically book in first quarter were being booked in second quarter, and they were being booked for stays within a very short time period. Period. So it typically stays within the first 30 days uh, of arrival from the time that they booked. And so they were booking Memorial Day through June, keeping a close eye and starting to book July. Um, and then, of course, the, the question that we'll look at, at throughout the slides today is what's happened over the last few weeks as Florida's started to become a little bit more uh, talked about in terms of the COVID rebound and, be, and is becoming one of the states that gets a lot more attention. So. We've got this data through this week. So as we dig into the Florida, I want you to keep an eye on kind of what's happened in the last week or two. And Dan will talk you through about that. But North America as a whole, you've really got kind of a return to last year's normal. The zero line being, uh, you know, the exact same number of bookings we were having last year. So the spike below, the spike above, and then the return to normal. So just another way of looking at the percent change in guest bookings for last year versus this year few different stories across the U.S. You've got states like Hawaii who are still uh, completely shut down and then you've got some significant pockets uh, that have either been shut down for longer periods of time or that have returned to shutdowns. And so when you look at this aggregate, aggregated data, you know, you've got to take into account that you've still got some pretty significant vacation rental markets that are shut down and are weighing uh, what would be a little bit higher data down uh, further than what you'd expect. But you see that same overall curve and we started to see you know, a spike down below last year. Uh, two things that are causing that. One is there was a little bit of a return uh, to a concern over COVID, but more predominantly what we saw is just the lack of inventory. The, the demand really just outweighed the supply. And we got to the spot where most of our traditional vacation rentals in Florida, absent a few that Dan will take you through, particularly the urban markets, were just full for the summer. And so, you saw a dip, but it did not continue. We're seeing it return back up across the U.S., and that's despite those shutdown markets. So good news, uh, really, it, it, considering what's happening in the news with COVID in terms of what that demand looks like uh, versus last year. 
And then a chart that Dan's gonna show you for many of your markets in particular, I'll just orient you real quickly because we use this chart a lot. We used it on the last webinar. This is comparing pacing for the United States and then we'll show you for each of the sub markets within Florida. Uh, and the way to read this chart is basically the black line on the right is where 2019 ended up, as is the green. Uh, and then the blue line is where we're pacing today. And so green line as it continues over to the right is where we should be pacing. So if you look in the uh, August, September, October timeframe, black line is where it ended up. Green line is where it was pacing this same week last year. And blue line is where it's pacing this year. So if the blue line is touching the green line in all these charts. We're pacing exactly where we were last year. Uh, this is the overall US. Again, a reminder that you've got several markets that are closed that are pulling down the average. So what I wanna draw your attention to is obviously we saw the trough here where all of, essentially of the US was shut down with the initial outbreak of COVID. But if you look at that you know, steep incline in the middle of May, right as we come into Memorial Day, you've got this year's performance essentially equating with last year's performance. You've got a little bit of a, of a, a miss there in the third week of, of June and in the uh, first week of July. But more importantly for your businesses, is if you look going forward, the rest of the year is still pacing on track, if not slightly above track, in terms of where we would expect the demand and the bookings to be for vacation rentals. I want you to pay attention to exactly what this curve looks like for each of your areas. But I will note, for comparison purposes, if you look around the country, you saw some markets where we really came up and we outpaced last year. Arizona is a good example of that. North Carolina is a good example of that. And so you kind of balance what happened in some of those markets. Um, you'll see how Florida stacks up in just a second. But, you know, on balance, despite COVID, really once we open back up, the demand was there and we're having a year and a summer and a fall in particular that look very much like what we'd expect it to look like in previous years. Uh, last slide, then I'll let Dan jump into the, uh, the Florida aspects is I wanted you to look at cancellations. This is the number of cancellations this year in blue, as you would expect a tremendous spike there when COVID initially hit, black or, or, or gray there, the, the baseline of what you would expect in a normal year, that's last year's cancellation. And what we've been watching and getting a lot of questions about over the last few weeks is, are we really seeing a spike back up? And you saw there at the beginning of July, we, it, it took a dramatic turn and we thought it was gonna spike back up with the news, but it really has and it's leveled off. And as we talk to our partners across Florida and we look at the data sets, what we're seeing is that, you know, we, we're running about 12, 13% higher percentage of cancellations than we would in a normal year. But in almost every instance in most markets across Florida in particular, the demand is significant enough that when a cancellation comes in, a booking comes in to rebook it and follow it. And so, you know, thankfully, with something we're gonna to continue to watch as we continue to stay in the news here in Florida, but no significant jump uh, for the United States and no significant real jump uh, for most of the Florida markets in terms of cancellations. So with that, I wanna introduce Dan to talk a little bit about the Florida data. A lot of you on the call probably know Dan. I tease him about being the most handsome man in vacation rentals, but he's been in vacation rentals forever. Uh, he spent a lot of time in the Florida markets. He's a Nebraska guy, uh, but he's really spent his career working with vacation rental companies and vacation rental data and trying to help uh, companies understand how to better market their businesses. He was in uh, radio before that, but when he jumped into vacation rentals, he was uh, with one of the leading marketing companies and then we were lucky enough to bring him over to Key Data. So, Dan, I'll turn over to Florida to you, and I'll try to do a good job of flipping through the slides here as you talk us through them. Well, thank you for the flattering remarks, Jason. Uh, uh, don't get too distracted by my beauty, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Excited to tell you a little bit about what's going on in Florida. There's um, a lot of different uh, uh, situations going on, and uh, we'd love to show you all of them, but there's just so much we have to trim it down. So we're going to be look at a lot of stuff regionally today. We're going to pull up a few things that are um, specific to individual markets. And the first one here 
that we want to look at is just the Florida adjusted pay to occupancy. Um, I want to point out one thing when we look at that adjusted pay to occupancy. Anybody who knows vacation rentals knows that there's a uh, hundred ways to Sunday that they're messed up. And what we do to make that data normal is we actually kick out any owner stays or maintenance holds and give you just the days that are actually available to rent. Um, so when we see adjusted pay to occupancy, I just want to bring that up that um, it's 100% accurate information about what's actually available on those days. We're kicking out owner stays and maintenance holds, which a lot of people saw during, um, during the COVID outbreak is, is a lot of um, holds or owner stays. So something important to uh, point out in the data. You'll notice that there is a lot of pent up demand that uh, caused an explosion of bookings really starting that uh, first week that Florida opened up on 523. Um, but it didn't quite, what I like to say is catch the wave all the way to last year's levels. You know, you saw it rise, but it kind of fell short about 5% um, when it got to its peak. Uh, really interesting uh, thing that it just kind of, it's it stalled. Um, it remains about just 5% down through August, so a manageable amount from an occupancy perspective. Um, but again, these are numbers for all of Florida. We're gonna look into individual markets, but as a whole, Florida is kind of at that, well, it's not quite as good as last year, but we're still in line with kind of the trends of last year. Um, the really interesting thing comes this fall. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions. Um, what happens with school calendars? Uh, what happens if they extend summers, which uh, they're doing up in the Northwest, I guess. Um, also, you know, what if they shorten Thanksgiving? What's going to happen during November? Um, what if there's another shutdown um, where they, they, you know, just blanket shut down um, workplaces and stuff. And, you know, what about the work from home environment? We're hearing a lot of people speculate that um, this fall, there's going to be this massive movement to work from home, and that means you can go work anywhere. Um, so, you know, a lot of those people who went back to work, are they going to put up the money to go stay in a vacation rental and work from that vacation rental? So what's making all of this up that you see on this slide um, with the adjusted paid occupancy? So now we'll dive into some of the different individual um, regions. So bringing up that Northwest Florida market, um, you know, there's minimal congruency throughout Florida. They're all different graphs. But when it comes to getting on track, there are two very different stories. And it really comes down to leisure versus urban. You'll see in Northwest Florida in the upper left and Southwest Florida in the lower right, they're acting essentially normal, falling right in line with last year. And they're really on track with what we'd expect from a booking perspective and from an occupancy perspective um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, really on pace with where they normally are. Now, the stark contrast is really starts in Central Florida. It's clearly having the biggest impact pulling down the occupancy that we saw on that last screen. Um, likewise, Southeast Florida region is also pulling down the average for Florida. Um, it's really um, the urban market is pulling down a lot of the uh, occupancy numbers that we see uh, this year versus last year. Um, so those are the, the, the big takeaways from this is that that occupancy pacing is just being dragged down by the urban markets. Now, diving into some of those leisure markets, Jason said, you know, we, we're working with so many people in Florida, we can't put them all on the graph. Um, but we want to uh, kind of highlight what's happening in some of these um, specific leisure markets. Um, starting up in, uh, up in the Destin area, um, it's remarkably consistent, by the way, across each one of these individual leisure markets. They're all falling within a few percent of pace for the summer and continuously closing the gap compared to last year. Um, looking at Destin, um, right in line with where they were for the most of the summer, um, and then right in line for the, for the fall. Fort Myers, uh, same thing happens. They stay right in um, right in line with last year's numbers and then uh, actually not that far off from where they ended last year. Um, so opportunity there, I mean, those are the types of markets that are gonna have the opportunity to maybe cover some of their gap uh, can, can, uh, because of COVID by extending their season and going into those fall uh, time periods. You can see they have low occupancy traditionally that time of year. So it's a great time to pick up a little bit. 
Same thing, Panama City Beach, um, right in line with last year's summer numbers going into the fall, uh, keeping right on track and uh, not being that far off actually from where they finished off the year. Any, those are the, the areas, like I say, that they're really gonna have that opportunity to make some of that up, especially if there is any of the you know, extended uh, summer breaks, ex any, any uh, shutdown of schools or anything that's where you're gonna have some opportunity to kind of pick up some of those travelers. Um, now, looking at the uh, urban markets a little bit here, there's no shocker that theme park closures uh, caused a massive and lasting drop in Orlando's occupancy, but it is confirming that expectation. There's two interesting things to observe with Miami-Dade. Um, for example, there's not much of a COVID crash, um, which I think is a little shocking to me, um, especially compared to what we've just looked at with um, the rest of Florida and the rest of the United States. They just didn't have that crash in the middle of the pandemic. But with the current state of COVID in that area, the outlook is bad and honestly, it's falling fast. Um, there's only so many times that CNN and all the different news channels can say bad things about you before you start to lose some of that. Um, demand. Uh, um, now let's uh, take a look at um, the average daily rate throughout Florida. This is, I mean, the driver for the money. So ADR during the first wave of closures can be somewhat misleading. So let's really focus on the times of opening, which is outside of basically 314 to 523. You'll see that that unconstrained demand really coming out of the first round of closures allowed property managers to maintain rates in line with last year at least. Um, in some cases, they even exceeded last year's rates. Those are the serious revenue managers coming into the vacation rental space specifically. Um, and for some markets, that ability to save the year in terms of RevPAR is really gonna depend on pushing the rate in the coming months. Um, you can really see this happening on the average here just in the last couple of weeks, look at that separation um, from 7.4 to 7.18, um, really starting to actually raise their rates during a time of year when the rates usually start to drop. Yeah, I'm curious, Dan, just uh, to watch what we were talking about this morning, whether or not this will continue to separate as the, you know, the issues you brought up. If, if people are really able to use the next month where traditionally kids would be in school and be returning to come you know, stay at that beach house in Florida, is the market going to be able to keep rates up for the summer because the demand stays there? And I think we're, we're all kind of anxiously watching that, but school calendars just starting to come out this week. And so I think there's a story to, to tell here that we'll be excited to share with you guys in the coming weeks. Um, looking at the average daily rate throughout Florida and the different regions, I mean, um, very similar situation to all of Florida, the, 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 rates have kind of stayed in line with where they typically are. Um, obviously, you saw things crash during the COVID. Um, some places that uh, may have been open after 523 may have kept their rates down a little further just to guarantee a little bit of a comeback. Um, keep in mind, vacation rental managers are working for the individual homeowners, so uh, they got to make sure they get some money on the books. And uh, that act of desperation may have cost the average daily rate average a little bit um, throughout the year. Um, but Central Florida, um, people are, or the vacation rental managers, um, there's not a lot of activity going on outside of the theme parks. And so you see that, that little bit of a spread in, in Central Florida um, where the rate has dropped a little bit. Um, certainly pushing rate in Northwest Florida and pushing rate in Southwest Florida as well. Now, one of the most exciting and valuable metrics we get to see is cancellations. And maybe I shouldn't use the word exciting. It's uh, kind of depressing. <laughs> um, but there's, there's no doubt that it's kind of a living, breathing organism. So when we look at this graph, it kind of looks like a heart monitor. So uh, I guess that's kind of fitting. Um, but you see those cancellations and the spikes. And, and you certainly saw that. In, during COVID and when the, when, the camp, when the shutdown happened for vacation rentals. Um, but certainly from 523 on, that, that cancellation number it really didn't go up or, or down tremendously more than it typically does. Um, so there's no real lifts in cancellation numbers. Um, there's the obnoxious press that you guys are getting right now. Um, and it's 
honestly, it's, I think people have sort of tuned it out um, because they're certainly not the cancellations that you think, or people are at least, they're conscientious of it when they're booking their property because that shorter booking window. So those cancellations aren't happening because they kind of expected it to happen to begin with. Um, yeah, we're really seeing almost then, if you think about it, just it, it's a resiliency that I, I don't think if we look at the hotel data, which you and I looked at closely yesterday, you know, the hotels are still 42 to 45 percent down. I direct you to, to visit Florida's excellent website where they share some of that star data, which a lot of you guys see. But, um, you know, the curves for the other lodging segments don't look like the curves for this vacation rental data. And so, you know, what we've talked about as a group is just even though the, you know, the press and the COVID and, and in many cases necessarily so is putting a damper on travel. I think what we're seeing from a demand perspective is, you know, there's still just a, a willingness to come spend time in these private accommodations that really is, is surpassing even our expectations. We thought we would see as the, as the news drove, you know, the, the indications that the, the spikes were coming back up. We thought we would see the cancellations and demand come with it. And we certainly might, uh, and we might be seeing them in some of the smaller markets, but on the whole, you can see across all of these markets, uh, despite the increases, people are still willing uh, to come spend time in a private home. And it might be less travel outside of the private home, less usage of the restaurants while they're in town, like we're seeing up here in Northwest Florida, but uh, still you know, a good choice to get away from normal life and, and come stay in a house. So we're excited to at least see that for the vacation rental space, uh, despite what's going on. And one last thing to add on that is just the, the cancellations, they're not really affecting the occupancy rates as we've seen over the last few slides. I mean, the many of the cancellations, even in the, in the heart of COVID, many of the cancellations were for the rest of the summer, right? That's right. Um, and uh, vacation rental managers have had almost no trouble um, filling in behind those cancellations. So some of these places, you know, where you've had uh, round one, you had cancellations because people weren't sure what was gonna happen with vacation rentals. Um, then you saw uh, the shutdown actually happened. And so you saw a spike of cancellations. Then you had the ban actually happen. So you saw more cancellations. But some of those properties had already been booked twice for the same weeks. That's and right. then you have kind of that third time of, of some of these, some of these properties were booked for the same week, three, maybe four times based on the different uh, situations that have come up. So yeah, they're still filling even despite the cancellations. Now, the graph in front of you is a little more complex. Uh, we always joke that the uh, the data team uh, likes to throw throw people who don't have letters behind their name uh, off. Um, so when we look at the this graph, uh, the big thing to think about is that you want the blue line on top, um, or excuse me, you want the orange line on top. Uh, so we're looking at what our average booking window is um, this year versus last year and looking at it in each of the respective months and uh, so far this year. And what you can see here is that that average booking window has dramatically dropped throughout the year if you're talking, if you wanna uh, make a blanket statement about the year. Um, keep in mind that vacation rentals uh, typically have a much longer um, booking window than, than hotels um, and some of these uh, properties are booked a year in advance. So a lot of the stays that are happening in June or July, um, people didn't cancel because they already had them on the books and they thought they would be open by then. So they didn't have those cancellations. Um, but those last minute bookings that usually come, you know, two, three months out, that's what we're starting to see um, to, to be able to evaluate the impacts of. Because typically April would be a hot booking month for July. And uh, when we look at that July um, timeframe, and in June for that matter, um, you start to see that booking window actually kind of um, um, lengthen out just a little bit and the spread starts to compress versus last year. So um, you see it dip way down there in May, and it comes up a little bit in June and it gets much closer in July to what it typically is. That's right. And I think it's reflective of, you know, there was that time period when the demand popped back open, that people were willing to come, you know, you called it un unconstrained demand, and I, I certainly think that existed, but they were, weren't were real comfortable looking, you know, say 70 days out as they typically are. They were comfortable looking 35 days out. So still very 
cautious in terms of making long-term travel plans. And we're seeing that slowly creep back up. We expect it to slowly creep back up, but it's getting closer and closer to normal. So, um, you know, best way to read it is a, a deep hesitancy coming out of COVID initially in terms of a willingness to speculate about what things were gonna be uh, in the future, but something that we're seeing slowly and slowly return to, to normal. And the question for our team is, as we get into August and September, will we see booking windows, you know, return back to normal or will they continue to be, you know, much shorter than average? So something we've been watching. Absolutely. Now, the guess, uh, the average length of stay has been, um, it's probably the, the most surprising thing to me um, for as, as, as far as compared to expectations. Um, you know, guests already in homes during uh, the actual vacation rental ban were allowed to stay. And many of them, obviously, um, it kind of felt like the world was ending. So why not spend another week in that vacation rental that you're already in? Um, so you're seeing, you see some of that average length of stay kind of increase uh, during April. Let's throw that one out and call it an outlier because um, that's really what it is. Um, there's really a normal expected variance at best um, with the average length of stay. The reason why I said that, every, that it was surprising to me um, is that pretty much everybody who works in the vacation rental space um, has said for the past, since COVID uh, happened, everybody said, well, the average length of stay is going to explode because people want to go get away and they want to um, be away for a long time. So you're going to start to see monthly bookings and that's the new norm. Well, we really haven't seen any of that in the average length of stay. And I think the big reason um, is partially that, um, well, the biggest reason is that guests still have to pay for that stay. So um, especially in some of those leisure markets, your pricing for a week stay, you know, can easily be $10,000 during the peak summer months. So you end up with some of these, uh, the guests still, would still have to pay that. So staying an extra week is a pretty substantial hit to the bank. Um, so I think that's the biggest reason why you're not seeing the average length of stay actually expand too much. Um, yeah, and we, we still hear a lot about it. What's what Dan said, he's kind of surprised. Just the, the discussions in the vacation rental space continue to center around will the average length of stay expand. And I think um, a lot of that is probably tied to what you're seeing in the urban markets. You guys will recall, uh, you know, a lot of um, new vacation rentals coming into these core urban markets where they started to, you know, convert class A office space into, into vacation rental companies, some companies like Sonder, for example, that hit the market and became very popular was well, the demand for that stay in an urban market, certainly the, the, the business traveler, but even the, the leisure traveler, as that demand in those urban markets has dissipated, if not disappeared recently, you're starting to see some of those vacation rentals uh, that typically could rent for a weekend or a week start to convert some of their inventory into longer term stays the people who are in town and want to stay for six months or a longer term lease and so i think you'll see in the urban markets some of that average length of stay expand but as dan said in your traditional le leisure markets where people are used to coming down and spending a saturday to saturday in the summer for a pretty steep uh, rate you're just not seeing people who are able to say suddenly hey we want to come to destin and stay for three weeks or you know come to one of the other high-end uh, leisure markets in Florida. So pretty, pretty typical stays so far. And we will see uh, if that changes right in the fall when the, either the kids' vacation windows get compressed or at the beginning when kids are later to go back to school, I would expect we'd have some longer length of stays in August, but time will tell. I think it's also fair to, fair to mention that, you know, the, there's also the calendars don't allow the longer stay because right. you have a stay that was booked a year ago for one week in the middle of June that messes up anybody that wanted to stay from June 1st okay. to June 30th. So um, that, that's another restriction that uh, doesn't allow that uh, average length to stay to right. really expand. So now uh, which dates are being booked? Now this is one of the most exciting things that we get to see at Key Data is just what's actually being booked this week. So what we're looking at here is that in the last seven days, um, you know, what's really happened in bookings? When are people actually booking? And it's pretty obvious that people are still looking at that 30 to 60 day range um, as far as when they're gonna be able to come. 
you know, over, over half the bookings, over almost three quarters of the bookings were um, just in the next two months. So um, really uh, going to be, uh, property managers are really going to be finding opportunities to gain some ground with those last minute bookings for anybody who wants to make up for that dip in the early spring um, or in the early summer. Um, you can really have that little bit of opportunity in September maybe October, depending on what happens with schools, as Jason said, and, and some of the restrictions that are in place. You're really still seeing that short booking window, right? Nobody's thinking four or five months out until they know what's going on with the school calendar. Yep. And then uh, that brings us to the feeder markets. Now, again, uh, I know I keep saying it, but this is also one of those really exciting things that's in key data. And, and the reason why is because you can't have this data if you don't um, actually integrate with the property management systems. And because we do um, we work with over 40 different property management systems, we're really able to directly um, see in real time where the guests are coming from. And I think everybody really has said um, since COVID, uh, came out in the news that there was just about everybody really anticipated a really hyper local drive market, but that just didn't happen. Uh, remarkably uh, similar to previous years. Now, obviously I wanna point out that there's variance by market. Um, you know, if you look at Southeast Florida versus Northwest Florida, that's gonna be a completely different uh, feeder map. This is showing you where revenue is coming from in the state of Florida. Um, I want to point that out because um, if we ran the same report for two different individual markets, um, you'd get two totally different um, reports. But generally speaking, the makeup of the Florida visitor to vacation rentals is almost exactly the same uh, we were trying to find variances yesterday, and you might see, you know, the number one market and the number two market flip in some areas, um, but it's usually still the same top 10 markets that are feeding you most of your reservations. So to give you a few takeaways, um, we really saw that pent up demand was there um, coming out of COVID and uh, really helped fuel the fire for most of the second half of the summer, um, as well as looking at the uh, fall. Uh, it's really keeping in line with what's normal. Um, there's really no, um, or sorry, the urban uh, held state, the urban markets held the state numbers down a little bit in Orlando and Miami. Um, there was really no new big jump in cancellations um, and even more importantly, the vacation rental managers were able to fill in the reservations behind those who did cancel. It was a really strong summer ADR compared to what a lot of people thought. A lot of people thought they would have to um, lower um, the ADR in order to get those reservations, and that simply didn't happen. Uh, the booking window is still shorter, which is exactly what we'd expect. Um, there's no real change in the length of stay for summer, um, which is a big surprise for most people. Uh, the same high level feeder markets um, are really there this year versus last year, um, which defies, I think, everybody's expectations of having that super local drive market. And then uh, looking forward, um, which is really what um, you, everybody's really paying attention to now is what's going to happen with fall school calendars. It's probably the single most important thing for trying to lengthen that um, season out a little bit and uh, cover some of the losses. Um, what about shrinking holidays? What's going to happen with Thanksgiving break? What's going to happen with Christmas break? Um, are you going to start to see uh, the schools shorten what those windows look like for vacations? Because those are big times for people. Um, what happens if there's another COVID spike? And then what are the other state quarantine restrictions that may come out? Uh, we certainly are seeing that. Jason mentioned, you know, you throw a Hawaii into a graph and it'll throw off everything. Um, that's certainly something that we saw uh, in Hawaii with their 14-day mandatory quarantine. What's going to happen with that around the country? Uh, and who's going to add that in? Yeah, and I can, Dan, I can see some questions coming in, but I'm, in middle, I'm unable to see them on my screen. I think they're hidden in one of my other windows somewhere. Uh, so happy to answer any questions, but might have to have you read them to us or just talk us through them. Uh, appreciate you walking us through those, Dan. I, I'm, I'm like you, I'm kind of anxious to see the next couple of weeks and what happens with everybody's calendars to, to tell us what's gonna happen for the fall. Cause I think there is a lot of excitement about 
the chance that we can make up, as you said, for some of the trough that we had in, in April and May in the August, September timeframe. So time, yeah. time will certainly tell. I can take a couple of these questions here. Uh, do we take the storms into account for late summer 19 versus 20? Um, the, the short answer is yes, because all of our data comes directly from the reservation system. Um, everything is uh, real data that's coming through. It's real bookings, real cancellations. So we're not guessing on to whether or not that's occupancy. It's real occupancy. That's for yeah. sure. coming. And I think that, I, I, I think the subtext of that question is if there was a, you know, if there was a dip in the performance for 2019, did we adjust for that to put it back at, you know, the equivalent of a normal year? And the answer is we're just reporting 2019 as it occurred. And so if you look at that gap between 2020 and 2019, if in your particular market you say, well, 2019 isn't the best measurement of normal because of the impact of the storm for that particular month, then of course you have to take that into account. But we haven't done any kind of artificial adjustment to the data, it, uh, its occupancy as it occurred in 2019. So gr great question for, for understanding how that comparison uh, should be interpreted. Um, a bunch of people are asking for copies of the presentation. I believe that will be available by Visit Florida. So they will uh, for sure um, give that to you. Um, one question here is the average booking window uh, month shown. That's, that's actually th from the day of stay how far in advance was that made? So when we look at it on the graph, that's the date of the stay. So for a stay that was happening during that specific time period, it was X amount of days in advance. Yes, yeah, so if you've got a 30 day uh, booking window showing for June, that means on average, those stays that occurred with check-ins in June were made 30 days before arrival. Yep, exactly. Um, Alfred, uh, we certainly can uh, d d link up with us afterwards. Um, you can see the email on the screen. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about your um, about Central Florida and Kiss Me in more more in depth. So please let me know um, uh, who you are, and and uh, I'll absolutely reach out to you and and have that discussion. And obviously, um, one of the one of the uh, things that's hard to cover in a statewide presentation that Dan and I looked at is that feeder market data that we showed in that uh, that last slide. Now that obviously differs uh, pretty significantly for each market. I think the question Dan was trying to make sure we understood is there was a lot of people saying, well, we've really lost that whole Northeast and everybody that used to fly in and the overall state data showing that, that you didn't, which I think surprised Dan and I both. That, that willingness to travel uh, is still occurring, obviously, I assume occurring more by car than by plane, but really haven't lost as a whole state any, um, you know, traditional feeder markets completely. Particularly for Northwest Florida, we see, you know, a, a, a Dallas, Houston, uh, you know, Tennessee drive-through markets that have all stayed completely the same. But if you're in South Florida and you're really trying to understand how your feeder market has shifted, um, or if you're in one of the markets that has pulled traditionally more heavily from international markets um, and that, uh, that travel is not taking place now and you want to take a deeper dive, Dan has access to each of the feeder markets for each of your, uh, or each of the, the data points for your feeder markets. And so just touch base with him and he can kind of walk you through and give you some more details. Um, Brenna, please uh, reach out to me. I'll happily provide you with all the data for Northeast Florida. The, the short answer to your question is that we couldn't, uh, couldn't throw every region on there. Um, we certainly have uh, substantial data in Northeast Florida. Um, also, it depends on the individual market. Um, I understand that uh, we had to leave some uh, areas out, so please just let us know and, and I'll be happy to give you your own personal walkthrough of what the data looks like for Northeast Florida. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, we will go ahead and um, wrap up our webinar. I wanna thank our presenters, Dan and Jason from Key Data for taking the time to share these current and future trends they're seeing across the state so that our partners can make the best decisions possible during this challenging time. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you all on the line for joining us today. And I do wanna remind you again about the COVID-19 data dashboard that Visit Florida's created. 
Um, you can find the dashboard along with other COVID-19 and industry resources at our partner website, visitflorida.org. And we, um, we mentioned this at the beginning, but as a reminder, because we've had a lot of questions and comments, uh, this webinar was recorded and we always send the recording out and the link to the slides um, within one week. So be on the lookout over the next week from an email from us with a link to today's recording. And if you have any other questions, feel free to either contact the key data team. Um, they can put that slide back up with their contact information or you can um, contact our team directly at partner at visitflorida.org and we'll respond to you as soon as we can or we will get your question over to Jason and Dan. Um, so with that, this webinar is adjourned unless Jason and Dan have any other closing remarks. No, I just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And if we can help anybody in any way, please let us know. Great. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day and a restful weekend.